Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a television program that is designed to take you through the Bible in one year. We're very excited about that. And today we have some interesting reading from 2 Samuel chapter 8 to 12. We're going to look at this today. It's going to be good. Corey, what are you doing? Today I'm focusing in on some of the enemies of David, the nation of Ammon. All right, very good. And what did you do today? I'm going to talk about some of David's conquests that we read about in today's reading. Very good. Excellent. Ryan is here. Ryan, who are you interviewing? Well, today I'm going to be asking Dr. Stuart Burgess questions regarding the shape of the earth, the Big Bang Theory, and the reliability of the Bible. Very good. That's. I'm looking forward to all of this. Plus today we have a, a time when David made Israel strong and stable. How did he do that? With all his enemies, the, Phil uh, the uh, Philistines and everybody, everything else, how did he get them stable? We'll talk about that and more as we continue. Samuel chapter 10, we read of a, a war that David and the Israelites are forced to go into, and that is against the Ammonites, the king of Ammon. And at the end of this battle, you know, the Ammonites end up hiring some outside forces to help them. And Joab, the leader, the commander of the army is routed, and David actually has to go in and lead some of his own soldiers into battle. Take a look at the Ammonites. The people of Ammon appear frequently on the pages of scripture as descendants of Abraham's nephew, Lot. Their land is said to have been east of the Jordan River and referred to simply as Ammon. Their main city, housing a royal palace, was Rabbah, and by often referring to them as the children of Ammon, the Bible intimates that like Israel, they were a nation organized by tribes or families. The Bible also regularly refers to their national god by the name of Milcom. Now, while the Ammonites did not leave behind extensive written records, archaeologists have been able to piece together quite a bit about them. An Ammonite bronze bottle that was discovered in 1972 has an inscription on it that contains the exact phrase the Bible often uses of the Ammonites, the children of Ammon. The ruins of ancient Rabbah have also been excavated at the modern-day Amman Citadel and have yielded numerous finds from the Iron Age II period, which is roughly contemporary with the time of the kings of Israel and Judah. An inscription found in the citadel in the 1960s is believed to be either a building inscription written to commemorate the building of a temple or palace, or as a religious oracle given by Milcom. This inscription, along with signet seals found here, verify the Ammonites' main deity as Milcom and show how Ammonites would include portions of Milcom's names into names of their children, verifying that the Ammonites were actually distinguished by their worship to Milcom, just as the Israelites were distinguished by their worship of God. A series of stone statues and busts representing Milcom have been found, showing him bearded and wearing a crown. The images and statues of Ammonite kings that have been unearthed thus far instead show them with a headband or diadem rather than a full crown. The name of Baalis, an Ammonite king mentioned in the Bible, has also been identified on the signet seal of one of his servants. All in all, archaeological work in the region of ancient Ammon has generated a lot of verification of biblical history and has given physical, visual reference to these cousins of Israel. Back to 2 Samuel chapter 10 in this war with the Ammonites and, and their hired forces, the Arameans, we see David ending up having to come in as a last resort to help the Israelites with even more fighting forces, more fighting men uh, than Joab had at his disposal. Now, this would have been a little bit of a new role for David. You know, when you look at his earlier life and his earlier kingship, he's always leading the army. And this would have been a transition as well for Israel as a nation, you know, as a tribal nation, when you go back into the time period of the judges and even with King Saul, the king is always leading his own army. The judges would lead their own armies. Even uh, the female judge, Deborah, went with the army into battle. Uh, so, you know, 
Israel transitioning into a full-fledged kingship, yes, the king would go into battle, often did go into battle, but not all the time. That's why they had officials underneath them. That's why David trusted uh, Joab, who was actually a relative of his, one of his nephews, uh, with the army. Uh, but every once in a while, David was still needed in battle. And this will come back into play a little bit later on in the scriptures when we see David actually almost gets killed. He gets exhausted. You know, he's, he's not as young as he used to be. And uh, the army actually says, okay, that's enough, please. Israel needs you more uh, as your role as a political leader and as a spiritual leader and less as a military leader. So this transition for David clearly wasn't an easy one. Once King David settled down, he finished defeating the enemies of Israel. Now remember that King Saul had been told by God to do this. However, David would fulfill the command of the Lord. David came through very hard and difficult times. People were against him, even though he had done nothing wrong. Many misunderstood David. David had enemies that he should not have had, but he kept himself from getting too involved with evil. Still, the king had all sorts of things in his heart and mind. Above all, David was a man after God's own heart. It becomes obvious why God chose him as king over his nation. David came to power defeating those who hated Israel and blessing those who loved the nation. Second Samuel 8, verses 1 through 12. After this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Megath Emma from the hand of the Philistines. Then he defeated Moab. Forcing them down to the ground, he measured them off with a line. With two lines, he measured off those to be put to death, and with one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his territory at the river Euphrates. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that had belonged to the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Beta and from Barathai, cities of Hadadezer, King David took a large amount of bronze. When Toai, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer, then Toai sent Joram his son to King David to greet him and bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Hadadezer had been at war with Toai. And Joram brought with him articles of silver, articles of gold, and articles of bronze. King David also dedicated these to the Lord, along with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued, from Syria, from Moab, from the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, from Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 12.
We begin and we go into the time when David takes over Israel. This is fascinating. He has taken over and ruled the nation, that is the nation of Judah, for seven years. Now he's taking over Israel. When he goes in, he makes his efforts to make Israel strong and defeats their enemies. This is really interesting as we study and get this ready to understand what God is doing so that we can learn about that today in this world. This is uh, the Bible guide. If you don't have your copy, why not? Use the addresses at the bottom of the screen and write to us today and ask for the pocket guide. This is for our services and you can only get them here. And we take you through the Bible, it's very exciting. And also you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com. When you go there, do me a favor and uh, click on donate here, make a donation in any amount, that'll help us tremendously. We really appreciate that. As we focus on what David is doing and how this is working with the king, we learn from our words of truth, David finished the work. And when he finished the work, there's a lot to talk about here. We're 2 Samuel 8 to 12. As we go through the Bible, we continue reading. And this is very good. If you're joining us to go through the Bible, congratulations. You've gone a very good way so far. But we've got more to go, so just stay in there. We're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 12. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would teach us and show us your ways. Help us to see David. Help us to see what he's done here for Israel. And help us, Lord, to follow his example. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we said together, amen. As we look at the scripture, we learn some things. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. After this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metheg Emma from the hand of the Philistines, and then he defeated Moab, forcing them down to the ground. He measured them off with a line. With two lines, he measured off those to be put to death. With one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. Now, this is absolutely fascinating because David made Israel strong and stable. Now, beloved, we must become strong and stable people who love Jesus Christ. We must love the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are a Christian, I would encourage you to read through the Bible with us so you can get to know God and continue. And if you haven't started doing this, you need to do this. Pray every day. Read the Bible and pray every day. Make yourself strong. Make yourself stable so that you can... Tell God, Lord, I need to be strong and stable. And people will ask you about your faith. And you can tell them and be honest with them and help them to see that. Very important. Pray that God gives you people to talk to about Jesus Christ. Very important. David did that with Israel. He established them. He set them up well. Now this gets better because it's fascinating. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 3 says, David also defeated Hadazer, the son of Rehob, that's the king of Zorba, or Zoba, as he went to recover his territory at the river Euphrates, David took from him 1,000 chariots, that's a lot, 700 horsemen, and 22,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadazar, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. And then David put garrison cities with men in it uh, that were his men in Syria of Damascus. And the Syrians became David's servants and brought them tribute. So David, so the Lord preserved David wherever he went. Now this is Amazing. David acted with obedience to God. He acted with obedience to God to secure wherever he went. Now we know God is with us when we move in obedience. We should pray every day. And, and I tell people this and I do it and I don't always get it right. Let me tell you, I, as I go along in life, I'm doing better and better, but I don't always get it right. I try to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, tell me 
How am I supposed to do this today? What am I supposed to do? And I pray in the morning and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to go through the day. I need to know. I need to understand. And in Jesus' name, help me to go where I need to go. And when we listen, God goes before us so that we understand this is where we need to be. So we, we let the Lord speak to us. And then, of course, there's people there and there's things there. And let me tell you something. God does that, especially when we pray. So we need to pray, God, take me where you want us to go. We go back to 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. It says this, And David took the shields of gold that had belonged to the servant of Hadazer, and he brought them to Jerusalem, also from Betha and from Berothai, cities of Hadazer. King David took a large amount of bronze when Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all of the army of Hadazer. Then Toi sent Joram, his son, to King David to greet him and to bless him, because he had fought against Hadazer and defeated him, for Hadazer had been at war with Toi, or Toi. And Joram brought with him articles of silver, articles of gold, articles of bronze. And King David also dedicated these to the Lord, along with the silver and the gold that he had de dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued, from Syria and from Moab, from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines, from Amalek and from the spoil of Hadazer, from the sons or Hadazer, the son of Rohab, king of Zobah. Now this is important. Listen carefully. David gave all he had acquired, all he had acquired to Jerusalem for the temple. Any spoils that we gain from God must go to God. A lot of people say, well, wait a minute. If I do something for God and God gives me all this stuff, you should always remember that it is in our responsibility to tithe and to give offerings. And so as God's given to us, we need to give to others, beloved. We need to, to make that statement. We can't just sit around and say, oh, well, I'm going to take this in and take that in. We need to understand it is God who gives us the victory. When God gives us the victory as believers in Jesus Christ, as Christians, as people who follow God, then we need to say, Lord, I, I need to give you a tenth of this. I need to give you a portion of this back because we have succeeded on that basis. Now, that's important. And I want to tell you something. We need to understand this, and this is something important. You need to invite Jesus Christ, if you haven't, into your life to be the Lord of your life. You say, well, how do you do that, Rod? Very simple. It's not about you joining this ministry or joining a church. It's about you praying and saying, Lord, I believe that you came. I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again miraculously for the cost of my sin. I give you my life. Be my Lord today. Next time on Quick Study Television, Joab tricks David. What? It's absolutely true. We'll talk about that and much more still to come. Next time on Quick Study, we'll be here, so you make sure and you'll be there. Ryan? Well, today I'm sitting down with author and engineer Dr. Stuart Burgess to discuss our planet Earth, the Bible, and the Big Bang Theory. It's a longer interview, so let's get into it. Now, there's been a recent flat earth movement within the church which believes that the earth is not a globe but a flat disk. Now, as a Christian and engineer who has had experience working on spacecrafts, would you subscribe to that theory? 
I would not, and I'm a little bit surprised that uh, that theory is gaining some momentum. Perhaps it's a problem with the internet and the way, the way that works. Uh, but I certainly don't believe in a flat Earth. I've actually designed satellites that orbit the Earth and take pictures of the Earth, and I've done the calculations that put the circular orbit into motion, and that just wouldn't work if the Earth wasn't round. So my work has absolutely demonstrated that the Earth is round. Uh, it is important for Christians to see the Earth as at the centre of God's purposes in the universe. Um, I've absolutely no doubt that the Earth is unique in the universe, the, the Earth is uniquely important, but I certainly don't believe that the Earth is flat. Well, many claim that the Bible is the world's greatest book of fiction, a mere book of fairy tales and fantasies. Now, as a scientist, do you agree with those claims? I've been very much encouraged with my faith uh, that the Bible is very trustworthy. Uh, many verses in the Bible, like first, uh, Psalm 19, says God's word is, is trustworthy. I found that from personal experience, reading through the Bible, uh, reading the promises that, I, that are there in the Bible, but also even from a scientific point of view, there are many verses in the Bible that have been proven to be true by modern discoveries. Uh, to give you some examples, in the Bible it says the stars are without number. Now we've only just discovered that in recent years, that the universe is vast, and yet the Bible writers could write that so many years ago. And there are other verses too. There's a verse in the book of Job where he says, have you entered the treasury of snow? And only in modern times have we had the microscopes to see the, the treasury of those hexagonal patterns. And uh, the Bible speaks of the circle of the earth. And in Job, it says he hangs the earth on nothing. There are many verses in the, book, in, in, in the Bible that have been proven to be correct with modern discoveries. And then there's also archeological evidence as well. So it's, it's a remarkable book and it has been shown uh, to be true. Uh, the Big Bang Theory right now is the, the model for the origin of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you, would you subscribe to the Big Bang Theory? Uh, I don't subscribe to the Big Bang Theory one of the reasons is it doesn't explain where matter came from. Uh, I think that's the great weakness. You can't say there's nothing and then nothing exploded and then we have an ordered universe. That just doesn't make sense. In fact, to mechanical engineers, the first law we teach them is the first law of thermodynamics, which basically says you can't just create matter from nothing uh, because matter and energy are constant. So you need an almighty creator to actually bring forth matter and energy. So that's the biggest flaw in the Big Bang Theory. Obviously, there is evidence that the universe is expanding, uh, but that's exactly what I would expect if God had created the universe 6,000 years ago because an expanding universe is a stable universe. Uh, if God created a static universe, it would then collapse in on itself. And so uh, a, a designer with perfect wisdom, it's natural that they will create an expanding stable universe. So the universe I see has hallmarks of design. I really want to encourage you to check out Dr. Burgess's material. I actually have one of his books here, which is called Hallmarks of Design. You can get this particular book through Creation Ministries International. Their website is creation.com. He's also got other books and DVDs as well, some of which are available there as well. Some of his other books can be found online through places like Amazon, and you might be able to even order them through your local Christian bookstore as well. More tomorrow. Yeah, it's true. The bookstore is creation.com, and you can go there and get it. It's an excellent yep. website. And that is a great book, by the way. Oh, it's an excellent book. Yes, it is. And, and he is a, he's a brilliant scientist. I, I love him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, yeah, me he, too. Really, I mean, he is one of those guys that uh, just states it like it is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he is every day working that way. So, I mean, you well, know. Well, I remember just sitting there in the interview, just being baffled at, at you know, his responses, I, I just gleaning all the information and I just couldn't believe 
how how knowledgeable he is. A lot of information too, and, yeah. and he works with it every day. Yeah. So it's sure. absolutely amazing. That's really good. Very good. Um, what did we do this month? Our offer for this month is called Quick Study Unplugged Spiritual Experiences, in which we, you know, we talk about different experiences that people have and different spiritual experiences that we read about in the scripture. So trying to jive and 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 figure out what people have experienced today and throughout the ages with what the Bible teaches about what spiritual reality is. So if you would like to get a hold of your copy of Quick Study Unplugged Spiritual Experiences, then get a hold of us. And for a gift of $25 or more, we will gift you with this. DVD. Very good. Look forward to that. What did you study today? Well, today we're looking at a second Samuel chapter eight, and I stopped at verse one. We have David and he is taking over and he's conquering a lot of nations. And it says here, after this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metheg Emma from the hand of the Philistines. And I have to admit that when I got to that Metheg Emma, I thought, what is that? Is that a person? Is that land? So I did a little bit of study on this. And the first statement that I want to make is the Philistines were never again a serious threat to Israel after David subdued them. Metheg Amah is really an unknown site. It literally means bridal of the cubit. Bridal of the cubit. So there are some who have suggested that this expression is figurative, metheg ama, indicating that David took the bridle or the reins of leadership from his enemies. So doesn't that put an interesting mm -hmm. twist, on twist it. Yeah, it does, does. at a little bit deeper meaning to this uh, first verse yeah. of chapter eight, mm -hmm. that David literally took the, 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 the reins of leadership away from his enemies. So. And of course the, the, the five cities of the Philistines were all there and they were, you know, they always uh, generated all of their decisions from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, David, it, I believe it was a site that was named after that, but you know, this can also be mm -hmm. just a, a bridal thing and that's fine. But I think the important part of that is to remember that they, he took them down. Right. Like they yeah. no longer had the ability to fight against Israel mm -hmm. the way they yeah. were. Yeah, not, not in the same capacity, yes, no. because we see from the time period of the later judges and yes. on, you know, the other warring nations kind of fade into the background and then you just start hearing about these Philistines over and over and over again until it's a tremendous issue for Israel. And, and that is really how David won his fame is in his fighting of the Philistines and his subdue, subduing of them. Of you know, them. a lot of people, mm -hmm. they, they, you know, you don't understand the fighting and all of that, and they think, you know, man, God's so violent. Why is there all this fighting going on? And then, you know, we look at the world today and we see a lot of difficulty mm -hmm. without God. You look at the Middle East, my goodness, you look at all of these things, and I want to tell you something, we still fight. But God comes into our life and changes us. And God gives us a new reason to exist. And our reason to exist is an eternal purpose. And I want to just say that if you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, why not? I mean, the Lord is good and he has promised us that he will give us that eternal purpose. If we turn our lives to him and make him the Lord of our life, I want to encourage you, pray with us. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I need you in my life. I need you now. Help me, Lord, to be somebody that goes beyond this life. Give me eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen.